Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, Marsha McNutt has been able to join us now. I, I think everyone is aware of uh, Marsha's extraordinary leadership at the National Academy of Sciences and of her critical role uh, as editor of science, in addition to a very distinguished uh, career prior to that. It, it's so important to us to have uh, leadership at every level uh, in promoting rigor and transparency uh, in research. Before you came in, Marsha, we were just talking about the needs for leadership at every sector that's relevant. And as you can see, we've kind of broken out into tables for the discussion in more detail after uh, your remarks and a brief panel today, uh, in which we're, we're looking specifically at the roles of researchers and of institutions and of funders and of the publishers and uh, leaders of the communication vehicles. We know that this is an area of interest to you personally and one that you've given a great deal of thought and contributed materially. And we're very eager to hear your thoughts this morning. Uh, delighted to welcome you and to thank you for being with us and look forward to hearing your comments. Marsha McNutt. Well, I have to say, Harvey, thank you for your leadership in this. And um, a special thanks to all of you uh, here uh, today and yesterday for this workshop, because this is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, all of the hard work that you are putting in to the actual implementation of um, all the uh, important um, uh, recommendations and uh, procedures that are necessary to make uh, reproducibility and replicability uh, in actual fact and not just something that we talk about and say, wouldn't it be nice if someone else does something about this? Well, you know, it's kind of like we're the someone else and, and we have to actually make this happen. And, and, and this is where we're going to start today to make sure that that actually happens. So I thought I'd start today with an example that just by, you know, my good luck, uh, Ken Fulton, who's the executive officer for the uh, National Academy of Sciences, um, happened to see in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and he shared this article with me. And the story begins with an anonymous whistleblower by the name of John Smith, who alerted a number of criminologists that he had noted some striking statistical irregularities in five published papers. So he sent emails to all of the co-authors in these five published papers that, hey, something's rotten in Denmark, you know, uh, I, I don't like what I'm seeing in these papers. Now, um, there was only one thing in common in these uh, five papers, and that is they had one common author. And the one common author was a faculty member at Florida State University. And that one common author was the author who had all the data. And one by one, the author shared that they had not seen the data. It was only this one author who had hoarded all the data. So one of the co-authors an associate professor at criminology, of criminology at uh, NYU Albany decided to follow up on the whistleblower's complaint. And it turned out that the um, FSU criminologist with all the data had been a mentor of his. And so he was very concerned about this guy's reputation and honestly wanted to clear up what he thought was just maybe confusion or you know, maybe a, a few mistakes. Um, so he contacted his mentor and said, could you send me the data? I wanna you know, fix, fix these issues. His mentor delayed and did some tap dancing and gave some excuses, but the data was never forthcoming. So the more the NYU professor dug into the matter, the more concerned he became. And what he saw was really disturbing. So phone surveys 
to landlines with response rates that were above 60%. Now, I don't know how many of you still have landlines and get random phone calls on them for surveys. How many of you, when that happens, actually answer the survey? All right, okay. Now, now is that 60% of the people in the room? I don't think so. And, and these surveys were conducted with no apparent funding by some unidentified entity that, that couldn't be found. Um, there were missing values in the surveys that were filled in with imputed ones. Oh, sounded like the person was maybe 60 years old. Um, so the NYU professor contacted the journal that, um, that uh, published the, the one of these five studies that he was actually a co-author on, uh, that was Criminology, one of the top uh, journals in that field. Um, and uh, he um, uh, sent a letter to the journal with his concerns. He also posted the letter with his concerns um, uh, online, where it was picked up by Retraction Watch. The lead author of the paper, who is actually not the FSU professor or him, it was yet an, another guy, um, was also very concerned and indicated that he either wanted to retract the paper or correct it, but without access to the original data, he couldn't do either. So criminology had two of the authors, the lead author, and this guy at NYU, both of whom were saying, something's wrong here, we want something to happen to this paper. So what happened next was interesting to say the least. The editor-in-chief of criminology, who was a colleague of this guy at NYU, uh, on the faculty with him, here's what he responded, and I'm gonna give you some quotes, quote, I don't quite know what retraction is. I can imagine that it could occur. I would think that there would be legalistic implications. He explained that unlike in other disciplines, and he goes on to mention those horrible people in psychology, uh, in criminology they have not developed, quote, a blood sport of ruining other people's careers. And he said, this is not the first time that papers were published in his journal that were complete gibberish. But he noted that someone should just point it out and that other criminologists would just take note. And there was no need for an investigation, a retraction, or social media outcry. He said faculty can still keep their positions and their reputations intact. And quote, I think to me that should be the reasonable outcome. The point is that there's no blood sport aspect to it. So the reason I started with this example today is that it illustrates a few of the principles relative to the topics of discussion here. The importance of, first of all, data availability, okay? Imagine how none of this would have gone down this way had there been data availability to begin with. Secondly, transparency of methods. You know, how is the data collected? How is it processed? The clarity in data inclusion and exclusion criteria. There are all sort of discrepancies about how big the survey even was and which data had been included. The application of appropriate statistical methods. No one was even clear how these data had been processed. And disclosure of funding sources. How do you do this big survey of 1,000 people without any funding, much less get a 60% um, uh, response rate? But beyond these important actions and many others that I'm sure you've all been discussing here, I want to emphasize the importance of signaling these indicators of trust. 
The most troubling part of the story to me was the part where the editor-in-chief of the journal was perfectly willing that insiders in the community would be well aware that this paper was rotten, that it was pure gibberish, in his words, but allow it to remain in the literature with no signal to any reader, people outside the community or members of the public, that it had been discredited. After all, research in criminology and many other fields can have direct and immediate impacts on public policy. So just this week, um, Kathleen Hall Jameson, Veronique Kiermer, uh, Richard Sever, and I published a paper in PNAS titled Signaling the Trustworthiness in Science. In this paper, we argue that science as a profession does have the right norms for encouraging qualities such as competence, integrity, and benevolence in the practice of research the three qualities that actually do instill trust in what we do. But we argue that do we, we do not necessarily clearly signal to ourselves, much less the public, when these norms are followed, much less when they are breached. And the disappointing part of the lack of signals is that in actual fact, signals can be reinforcing of the norms that they celebrate. And that is something that the Center for Open Sciences, Brian's group, has shown with journals that adopt their badges, that the badges are self-reinforcing. When the journals show the badges, more and more of the authors tend to adopt the practices that are signaled by the badges. And the badges right now are for open data, open materials, and pre-registration. But one can imagine additional badges that could be assigned for journals, by journals for studies that pass checks for plagiarism, image manipulation, independent statistics review, or independent reproduction or replication. Some of these, of course, might be assigned post facto, but in this age of uh, digital um, uh, journals, um, that might not be at all difficult to do. Now, in this paper, we also performed um, a survey of non-scientists, probably not with a 60% response rate, and found, in fact, I know it's not a 60% response rate, and found that they appreciate the same indicators of trustworthiness that um, uh, scientists value. For example, non-scientists uh, said that they are more likely to trust a study if scientists make data and methods transparent if they disclose who funded the study, and it have, if it is published in a peer-reviewed journal. In this perspective, we also identified a number of areas where the research community could benefit from improved practices. Peer review is one area. Standards of peer review vary greatly among journals, with some journals claiming peer review and never performing it. There are, a few signal, there are very few signals of quality of peer review currently, and in many cases, um, there's outright fraud in peer review. And those have been reported in science and in other journals. We propose some simple solutions to approve, improve the quality and transparency of peer review. Now, in the example with which I opened um, this uh, presentation, there was a disappointing case of a journal reluctant to even consider retraction of a very flawed study, one that probably had been fabricated. But we also argue in this um, uh, paper in PNES that using a single term retraction to describe all of the reasons why a study should be removed from the literature is probably counterproductive. There are some cases when studies suffer from honest errors. And considering those authors as culpable, um, as, as, as culpable as um, the, the authors whose papers were retracted for falsification or fabrication seems hardly fair. And we suggest that we need a new ontology of terms for the various reasons why papers are being removed from the literature to get more nuance and also encourage authors to remove papers 
in cases where they agree that they made an error or a mistake and they want to help clear up the literature. Now, it was clear from our survey with the public that um, uh, understanding if scientists are likely to have had a bias is important, and therefore full disclosure of funding sources, outside obligations, and competing interests is going to be um, helpful and uh, essential. When journals mandate such disclosures, um, which outside interest should be revealed is not necessarily clear either, nor is the time period. Past relationships, are they still relevant? What about a future relationship? What if you're about to join a board or about to take on a responsibility, but it hasn't happened yet? Moreover, reviewers and editors can have a difficult time verifying the accuracy of disclosures. Uh, we have certainly seen headlines in the news um, lately about trust issues that is, uh, ensued when researchers failed to disclose obligations to foreign institutions, and it impacted uh, the reputation of the work that they were doing. The standard response from scientists when this all came out was that they didn't know they had to disclose these relationships. So what to disclose should not be a mystery, and there should be easily accessed databases that funding agencies, journals, and institutions can share. Finally, just in closing, as a scientist, I'm dismayed when members of the public are misled by long discredited studies. We saw this happen with the Wakefield study. Everyone knew that study was wrong, but it persisted in the journal and was not retracted for 10 years after everyone knew it was wrong. But if everyone only includes research specialists, that's not good enough. It's about time for the scientific community to address this problem of consistent and meaningful signals of which studies are honoring the norms that sustain trust. So thank you very much for all the hard work that you're doing here today. And I really uh, want to thank you um, for being um, such champions for reproducibility, replicability, and trust in science, which is the natural outcome for the work you do. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you so much, uh, Marcia. You've actually given us a lot of concrete food for thought in the course of our uh, next uh, phase of our work together. Uh, let me invite a question from anyone in the workshop. Uh, or, uh, I've encountered many of the things you've spoken about. The biggest frustration in all the deals that I've encountered is was there were no consequences for misconduct, actual fraud, or sloppy science. There has to be some some response. If you make the top ten list on the top tier, there's something fundamentally wrong. And if you're one of the most highly cited, highly published highly funded scientists in the world, and you're on that list, big, big red flag. Yeah. So I, um, I've had a sort of epiphany on, on this. I think when I first started um, worrying about these issues, I was extremely reluctant to think about um, sanctions on um, authors and researchers for bad behavior because um, I worried that, uh, a, a couple things, worried about overreaction and worried about um, uh, the whole issues going underground. You know, that none of these things would surface because people were too concerned about these issues about ruining careers and things like that. Um, now I'm thinking that we're actually too far over on the spectrum of um, not taking action. And um, 
I do think that the appropriate uh, body that should be taking action are the employers of these people. I'm not necessarily sure that, you know, journals are the ones, but but I also think that I've I've certainly heard of funding agencies um, also, um, you know, when certainly when there's fraud in terms of mismanagement of grants and misappropriation of funds, that they do that too. Um, journals have been known to take action when um, when. Uh, authors violate um, their rules as well. So um, I, I think the, the pendulum is slowly moving back to um, understanding that unless there are some consequences, and in particular, um, the idea that no one should be untouchable. This uh, could be something other institutions do uh, take up as well. Thank you. Other first, and then Alexa. First, oh, Farindy. Sorry. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> yes. Can you hear me? Can, is this working? Yes. Um, thank you, Marsha, for, for your remark. I, I wanted to sort of go back to the, the discussion we've had yesterday around, um, so you, you pointed to some cases where things go horribly wrong, but, but yesterday I think there was also a lot of discussions about um, lowering the blood pressure of the entire population by a, a few degrees. So, so basically trying to have a, um, improvement um, uh, on a very broad basis. And I think what, what struck me yesterday is this, this need for coordination between the different actors that we have in the room here at these different tables. Yes. And this workshop was, was really helpful for that because we all come together in the same space. It's not very frequent that you have this mm -hmm. multi-stakeholder. Mm -hmm. And when we think about leadership, I, I was wondering if you could reflect on that and give us some food for thoughts about how to encourage that kind of cross-sector coordination. The National Academies have had experience of doing that in other, yeah. um, other fields. And so your, your thoughts on that would be very yeah. helpful. So. Um, uh, we are discussing quite seriously here at the Academy the idea of um, developing some enduring kind of activity here at the Academy that would take up the issue of the um, integrity, trust, transparency, um, within the um, research uh, enterprise across all stakeholders um, and try to help create a, a forum for sharing best practices and um, coordinating actions um, at an enterprise level. Because we know that uh, each of the groups independently have um, created bodies for doing it. You know, there's COPE within publishers and the um, research integrity officers of the various institutions get together, but um, there doesn't seem to be a body that helps them um, coordinate across um, the various phases from funding to execution to publication um, in order to make sure that everyone is on the same page and that there are not um, uh, discrepancies in handoff and, and fumbles. So um, I, I think that we're moving closer to that and we're going to have a retreat to discuss how we might uh, be helpful. It's a really important topic and actually one way to think about the product of our workshop would be the background paper for such a discussion, actually, would be, would be right. really relevant. Would be, would uh, Alexa, you were next, and then we'll come back over. Actually, a, a small point, but I think one important. I haven't had a chance to look at your paper, but um, this idea of an ontology of retraction is, is quite appealing. Um, and I just wondered, so in other words, um, so that we aren't punishing everybody equally, 
I think right. is the point, right? right? So if you make a mistake and it's an honest mistake, that should be very different from the case that you reported on from the Chronicle. So my only suggestion would be um, and hope would be that uh, as you start developing something like that, uh, that you work uh, closely when you're ready uh, with the National Library of Medicine with regards to or any of the other large uh, aggregators of, of papers to make sure that that is something that is actually visible and available um, going forward. So it was right. Just, just I, a I agree with that. Yeah, the mm -hmm. case I remember was when I was at Science. I got a phone call one day from a PI in Japan who was um, very distraught, and he said, um, I have just had one of my postdocs in my office, and he was um, so upset, he realized that he used the wrong calibration constants on um, reducing some satellite data, and the paper we published in Science two months ago everything's wrong in it, and we can't just correct the paper because all the figures are wrong, all our analysis wrong. Um, we're, we're really going to have to, um, you know, pull the paper. And, and I felt so bad because here it was an error they had discovered. He came to me with it. Um, and, uh, of course, when we write the retraction for the paper, we will write the reasons, and it will be clear that, that they initiated it, they found it, they did the right thing. But still, it's, it's, the way it's, it's, um, put forward is a retraction of the paper. And I felt so bad for the postdoc and so bad for the PI. Uh, here first, then, uh, I have Hal and Shai, and then we'll come over here. Um, hi, Marsha. I wanted to um, return to this issue of um, uh, sanctions for individuals and the point you made about individuals. One, one question I have is there's obviously a kind of like a marriage of convenience between an investigator and their institution. It's somewhat temporary, and the institutions have not taken a great deal of responsibility. But when we think of um, the issues we're discussing now, is it part of a bigger picture? I mean, you'll be familiar with the discussions about sexual harassment. And this is something that journals are now being faced with. When, what happens when you get a paper where one of the authors is a known, has, has been kind of convicted? Um, there's issues of bullying, etc. Do you think actually one potential solution is it's time for um, the National Academy to, uh, to consider the notion of creating a code of conduct for academics, breach of which then has known sanctions, which look, think, which look like, you know, I mean, if there's various misdemeanor offenses in, in law which result in community service. So you could imagine a code of conduct, breach of which meant that you have to go and take a specific course on research ethics over a period of weeks, and that's the way, and, and your institution as your employer can in, um, enforce adherence to that, because mm -hmm. there's some form of certification as an individual. So that's, that's an interesting idea, Richard. So the National Academy of Sciences does have a code of conduct, and the code of conduct does include research ethics, and it does um, uh, require that um, uh, adherence to, um, uh, to appropriate standards uh, for science research conduct um, for things like um, avoiding plagiarism, fabrication, falsification, uh, and also um, everything that's in our Fostering Research Integrity Report. Um, but it applies to members of the National Academy, which is the, the problem with it. So um, uh, I think where the National Academy would have uh, difficulty is that we cannot enforce it beyond our members. So um, one thing that could be done is suppose we set up this kind of round table with all these different stakeholders. Um, one action that this group could take is recommend that research institutions have this, and many of them do actually. Many research institutions do have codes of conduct for their faculty and their researchers that include things very much like are in the Academy Code of Conduct. I mean, we didn't dream this up out of nowhere. You know, we looked at examples from around the country, so. Okay, thank you very much. How are you with Next, and then Shai, and then we'll come over here and then back over, so. So, Marsha, I'd like you to address a 
milder form of scientific misconduct, which is the practice of spin. And how can journal editors be encouraged to be tougher about this? What sort of standards do we, should we develop so we know spin when we see it? Spin being the practice of, of uh, making a big deal out of one secondary outcome when the primary is negative. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think this could be um, an important part. You know, one thing that, um, uh, that I've advocated before, and I know a lot of other scientific societies have, is honestly, I don't think we do enough to um, train reviewers, editors. Um, I mean, most journals are actually run by volunteer editors. And we don't do enough in training reviewers and editors on the things that they need to look for. And one of the more important ones is spin. And um, when, uh, I forget which journal it was recently, did a survey of its, um, uh, uh, its um, sort of stakeholders as to what people wanted. And it was reviewer training. Because this is something that, that I think, you know, would be, um, it's, it's not that difficult a thing to do. It could be something at an annual meeting of ACS or APS or AGU where they have um, students and young researchers and even older researchers come in and say, what are the kinds of things that are really helpful um, for uh, reviewers to, to give feedback to editors on and things like that? Sort of like, I'm sorry, but I got to the conclusions and I read this and I said, where on earth did this come from? There's this blanket statement here that was in no way resolved by the data and it was also repeated in the abstract and I kept looking for evidence to convince me of this and it was nowhere. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, I think, time for the three more questions or comments that I've seen. Uh, thank you, Marsha, for this very interesting topic of conversation here. Um, my concern is that um, even if there are milder forms of negativity, um, people will still be reluctant to come forward and admit that, you know, even honest errors. Um, so maybe one should consider uh, at, as a positive. So writing watch or uh, correction watch and, and actually credit people for coming forward with, with uh, when they discover that they made honest mistakes. They should be actually you know, congratulated because they're setting the record right. They're saving others from going down the same rabbit hole. Um, yes, though we wouldn't want to get to the point where people see I wonder if I can get this published and then be the first to correct it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just figuring, you know academics and you know how they'll figure out how to game any system you set up. And I, I'm, yeah. just, I'm just thinking uh, uh, in my head the people who will figure out how they're going to make this work for them. So. Into two, it's a great <laughs> idea. Anyway, uh, we're here now, please. I could use a mic, I think, of it. Thank you. Hi. Um, is, this is such an interesting topic, and um, what, what I'm interested, I mean, what, what seems to be at the heart of a lot of uh, the uh, problems is also conflicts of interest. And, and I just wonder to what extent the higher institutions, universities, and colleges can approach their their uh, the corporate community and actually lay out some guidelines. I know some people say that's that's not feasible, but it seems to me that this has to be, that the higher education, the universities have to um, address this with. The, the corporate community, the pharmaceutical and other. Otherwise, uh, I think it just, it, 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 it's, it's just more difficult to, to get researchers and people to you know, be champions and do the right thing. So I, I guess I'm not quite 
sure what um, they're going to address. I, you know, the, the, the mantra I've always heard about this, whether it's corporate or um, any other kind, of, even foreign influence, you know, with, with what's going on right now with, um, with faculty members having affiliations overseas, um, the, even, even people in the government here, their very strong stance on it is they don't want to forbid it. They just want to know about it. They just want transparency. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure other than, but, but I think the important thing is, is that almost all of these relationships someone knows about, but it's just making sure that if the left hand knows about it, the right hand knows about it. And I think that's the important thing. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, I just wanted uh, metrics held a workshop in 2017 on, to develop this new taxo a, a proposed new taxonomy of withdrawals and corrections. We published it last year, and it actually uh, uh, it makes Shai's point. We have a whole list of different terminology, some of which is intended to give credit to the authors, some credit to the journal, and others obviously discrediting others. We included representatives from the NLM and all the major journals and and uh, <clears throat> and uh, cope. Um, so it's it's published. I sent it to you. Oh yeah, please. Um, and yep. you know, it would be useful. Uh, has that been? Is it something that like cope has blessed or anything? I mean, I'm just wondering how we can get it <clears throat> um, sort of injected into the journals and. Yeah. So I actually think cope had an activity, and I don't know exactly where it is. Doing something similar, that's much much simpler. Okay. Whether a simpler or more complex system is is best is, of course, yeah. okay. an open question. Right. But um, maybe Somia knows. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Stephen's point about um, kind of a more a nuanced ontology for retractions. So there is a second piece of work um, that's that's similar in concept and spirit to the metrics paper. That isn't a, a cope piece of work, but okay. it does include the authors are, were members of COPE at one point. Okay. Um, so it's Elizabeth Moylan, I, I don't want to actually, I don't have the list of authors in my head, but that's out as well. It's okay. a simple ontology, and uh, I can email that to you. Okay, well. good. So, you know, maybe this is, this is a non-problem that is, um, in the process of being solved, or maybe this is something that if we had this kind of roundtable at the academy, we could accelerate its adoption or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think it, it's certainly still a problem. Yeah. The issue of the adoption, the optimal, yeah. op optimal system is very much an open question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah. did you have something you wanted to add? Um, it's not, it's not huge at this point. I was just going to say that we've also thought about this, this concept of trying to have different types of retraction. Um, one of the things we talked about was it's actually, it's quite hard to get people to retract papers already sometimes. I mean, and I agree with you completely, Marsha, about those situations are very sad, those ones. But we thought about it and then decided not to because we were concerned that we'd end up arguing about which type of retraction we're going to do about whether to retract. So it might actually make it even harder to get people to retract. So that's why we didn't do it. The, uh, the range of imaginable unintended consequences for almost any good action is beyond what we normally consider. So uh, this is where a roundtable such as uh, Marsha is contemplating with the idea and of pilot testing. pilot projects. Exactly. I think, I think um, pilot projects where a couple different journals with different um, sort of cross-sections of types of papers um, do some pilot projects with it and and actually find out what some of the um, uh, results are. I, I think the, the problem with retractions are, of course, they don't happen very often. And so the, the problem with trying to do pilots is it can take a long time to get enough different examples before you finally kind of get to the point where you say, I think I understand what some of the um, unintended consequences might be of this, um, but uh, this is why I'm also a fan of editorial expressions of concern, um, and maybe there should also be an ontology for those, you know, where um, 
some of them are. Um, it's clear that the uh, concern is with author's bad behavior mm -hmm. uh, versus, um, you know, mm -hmm. concern with the data, concern with the conclusions. You know, what are you actually concerned with? Yeah. I, can I add a small thing? We also introduced something that we're calling editorial note, which is that when we have something to say about a paper, but uh. we don't want to retract it, or there's no, uh. or there's no reason to correct it or something, yeah. but to highlight that we did do an investigation and this was the outcome. Yeah. You know, okay. that when we've decided like not that. to do something, yeah. it's editorial note. Sure. Yeah. 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 Marcia, well, your, your words today have really helped us uh, in more ways than perhaps you could uh, know, because you've laid out some very concrete actions that we can also take account of. Uh, we're so appreciative of your leadership here and throughout this area, and we look forward to the next steps for the academies and hope we can contribute thank to it. To so thank you. Thank you very much.